this There we go. So um, just a, a couple of announcements. Um, so next week is exam week. So chapter, um, so from not six, including, but after six, six is the last one we had on the last exam. So this is gonna be eight, nine and, and forward. Um, and so it's gonna be another kind of a lecture lab combo. Um, three is the one that's decoupled uh, for us. So I was originally planning on um, starting with chapter 11, which is neurophysiology. But um, I figured it would be more prudent to dig into chapter 10. Um, and that's to keep our focus on muscles and um, not to distract us with other stuff that's going to be on the next unit exam, which is probably going to be the subject of either three, partially four. So those lecture exams. So there's a lot of anatomy in the muscles, but considering the last couple of weeks and tonight, I think having a little extra anatomy on the muscle side of things and a bunch of other things as well is going to be more helpful than anything. So instead of starting 11 now, um, we have plenty of time in the schedule to um, dig into 10 because there's a little bit more going on in 10 than say there was in seven, which was mostly just a recapitulation of bone anatomy. This one, there's a little bit more mechanics associated with it. And we've had a lot of physiology in the last several weeks um, with chapter nine, but now we get to sort of change our focus from the physiology of things to now more of like the mechanics of things, how things are connected, how things are moving, range of motion, those sorts of things, kind of putting it all together. And hopefully that I'm going to take this week and next week to do that. And then wherever we are at the end of next Thursday, I'll just cut it off and then we'll start um, the chapter 11 after that. So it'll be after exam week when we start chapter 11. That'll still give us a good month and a few weeks to work on the nervous system, which typically requires more time because there's more stuff in the nervous system than most other systems. So, so that's the idea. So we'll focus on 10 and sort of um, focus a bit more and kind of get a little bit more nitty gritty on muscle anatomy and muscle organization. Sound good? Um, so let's go ahead and dig in. So we're going to be taking a look at the muscular system, not just the anatomy, but kind of a little bit of everything. And so we'll uh, learn about nomenclature, kind of categorization, organization of the system itself. And then um, we'll obviously talk a lot about the different types of muscles. So there'll be a little bit of anatomy in there as well. That'll kind of dovetail nicely with your work on the models, which I know most of you still have yet to hit um, with any seriousness because uh, we've been using the last couple of weeks with for cats. Um, and so now we can uh, basically turn our attention to the models. Um, so basically when you take a look at muscles, you always start off with terminology. Um, and so typically when, you ever, when you're looking at muscleology, if you will, um, generally speaking, um, 
I'll let Sarah take care of that one. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so basically you have a couple of different conventions, ways that you can name muscles. Now, the reason why this is a good and important thing, and the reason why I went through this is because a lot of times when you look at muscle names, it's not obvious why you call a muscle one thing or another. There's actually a fairly logical progression to most of the muscle names, which if you understand the nature of how they're named, and the logic behind it oftentimes can make learning them a little easier because the names all of a sudden now have information to them and they basically are telling you what their name is. Okay, so the first thing that we have in muscleology we have to understand about the pieces of the muscle is their connections, right? So we talked a little bit about this um, beforehand, but basically the muscles will all have uh, two connections. One is called the origin. And this is basically the part of the muscle that is connected to the stationary bone. So typically a muscle will be attached to two bones. One is gonna be the stationary point. It's like your reference point. It's the bone that doesn't move, right? And then the other one is going to be the insertion. Now the insertion is the one that is designed to move. If you think about it, you basically have a connection uh, to two different points. Then if you're moving both points at the same time, you got to have some sort of a relative type of a reference point, right? Because otherwise what's going to happen is both points are going to basically move toward each other and you're not going to really get anything accomplished, right? So if you want to move something, you have to define which end stays put and which end is the one that does the moving. And that's what origin insertion does. The other piece is in between the two attachments. So between your origin and your insertion is the belly, which is typically the portion of the muscle, uh, it's usually the largest portion that we see that is basically intervening, what we would refer to as the muscle itself, okay? Now, you can have multiple bellies, like the biceps, for instance, or the triceps, which has three, um, but basically you have this region of musculature. This is where you're gonna find all of the muscle fibers and the sarcomeres and all that sort of stuff is in the belly region, okay? Generally, what you find at the origin and the insertion is mostly the tendon region, right? So that's gonna be mostly connective tissue at that point. And so the tendons are gonna be weaving into the periosteum uh, like we learned in chapter six. And basically this is gonna how you attach your tendons to your bones. Now, most tendons are cord-like or rope-like attaching muscles to the bones, but some of them are sheet-like, like an aponeurosis, for instance, is a sheet-like tendon. And so you see that from time to time. You don't see it commonly, but you do see it from time to time. Now, generally speaking, when you take a look at muscles and the way you group muscles together, you can define them according to their function. For instance, one muscle in particular is oftentimes the agonist. So this is the one that basically will cause a particular action that you are taking a look at. The other one is what's called an antagonist. This one is in opposition against the agonist. And these are important because oftentimes your muscles are grouped in antagonistic and agonistic groupings. So for instance, for a reflexor, there's an extensor. They do the opposite thing, right? So for instance, the biceps is going to be the flexor and the triceps is going to be the antagonist. Um, so ultimately, that's kind of how you have that wired. Most of your muscles are grouped that way. You also have what's called synergists. So a muscle can be basically what's called a synergist. A synergist is not the prime muscle, but typically a group of muscles that work together. So this is kind of like a team of muscles. Now, generally speaking, one of those is gonna be the prime mover. This is the one that does the major movement, the majority of what you're trying to get accomplished. And then typically along with it, it's gonna have an entourage or lesser members of the team that basically do secondary roles. For instance, fixators will oftentimes be stabilizers. So while the prime mover is doing the majority of the movement, the stabilizers, the fixators will be basically stabilizing the movement so that you don't get a lot of uh, extraneous 
secondary movement that could really cause a lot of problems and be kind of a bit of an energy waste. And so this basically will allow you to move your muscles very efficiently. So the examples we're using are biceps and triceps. So the triceps are the antagonistic grouping uh, that are responsible for flex, uh, extension. And the biceps are basically the agonist that are in charge of flexion, right? So you have the antagonist of flexion, which typically we refer to as extensors. And you have the agonist of flexion, which are the flexors. In this case, biceps is a flexor. Notice that for the biceps, the origin is going to be on the scapula, the coracoid process, and then the insertion is going to be on the radial tuberosity, which if you're wondering why you were studying such things as the radial tuberosity on your bones, this is the reason why, because there are tendons attached to that. And so each of those little bone structures have a reason for being there. So those are the important things, right? Origin, insertion, um, and especially antagonists, agonists, prime movers, and fixators. So those are important to really understand, especially complex movements. So one way also that you can cluster uh, muscles together is in the arrangement of their fascicles, right? So the fascicles or the way that the muscle fibers are bundled together and laid down can basically create different directional patterns. For instance, um, if you have a circular pattern, you are a circular muscle, right? So things like that are the orbicularis oris. If they're convergent, then basically they kind of are like a delta, a river delta system where they all kind of converge on a point, right? Your pectoralis major is a good example of this one. Oftentimes they're triangular in nature. You can have parallel fibers, which basically are laid down kind of in parallel to each other. Um, the rhomboids, for instance, that you saw connected to the scapula and the spinous process of the cervical. Um, is that too loud? Yeah, so that's just the vent for dissection. So we can shut it off until lab time. Yeah, we'll see if that quiets it down a little bit. Um, Penates basically is where you kind of fan out into sort of a pentagonal, um, sort of a fan-like structure. Bipenate is where you have essentially, it looks like a bird feather. We basically have two bird feathers that are kind of like right next to each other. Um, and then the multipennate is where you basically have lots of kind of these little bird feather-like progressions. They almost look like little feathers in there. Um, and that's the bipennate. And then fusiform, so we go from loud to louder, apparently. That's how this works out. So I think that's the freezer, the refrigerator over there. So these are basically where the fibers will actually fuse together into one. So the biceps, for instance, is an example of that. And so in some of these cases, you can name your muscles after the pattern of the fascicles that they take on. So when you're naming, typically you will name them either by location. So for instance, the pectoralis or the gluteus or the brachial, those are all right named after body regions, which is one of the reasons why we start off learning body regions in chapter one. You also can name them by size, right? So for instance, maximus, minimus, longus, brevis, those are all size names. You've run into a couple of those already, right? You also have the shape. The deltoid, for instance, is shaped like the Greek letter delta. Um, the quadratus basically is a quadrangle, basically kind of a, a, a quad shape, a rectangular shape. And teres is also a shape. So these are by shape. You can also, the orientation of the fascicles, for instance, if they're oblique, that means they're diagonal, or if they're rectus, that means they're rectangular. You can also name them by their insertion and origin. These are particularly helpful, especially in the forest, when you have all those little piano playing muscles um, that all look the same, right? Oftentimes they're named after what they're attached to. For instance, the sternocleidomastoid right, it's attached to the sternum and it goes up your neck and attaches to the mastoid process. So it's actually telling you where it's attached to. So this is that big rope-like muscle in your neck. Okay, that's one of the dominant neck muscles. 
Brachioradialis, for instance, is also a name, uh, a location or attachment name, right? So the brachium, the arm, right? The humerus and the radius, the radialis. So it's telling you that it's attached to the brachius or the, the uh, humerus and the radius. Those are the two attachment points of insertion and origin, yeah. Um, not necessarily, um, usually, uh, but not necessarily, um, because oftentimes you'll have um, you'll have attachment name conventions that will be kind of um, a little bit of a hybrid. Like for instance, uh, flexor carpi radialis is a little bit different. So it's not really it's an attachment because it's telling you it's a flexor of the carpals attached to the radial side. So it's kind of telling you what it does, but they're not necessarily organized in terms of like, oh, okay, so this side is the origin and this side is the insertion. Usually that's the case. Like, especially one with just, just a very clean, like obviously the brachial is gonna be the origin and the radius is the insertion, right? Um, but that's usually how it's, it, it works, but they can get convoluted. At times, but that's how they're. Tr that's how they try to do that. The problem is with AMP nomenclature; it's got some like several hundreds of years of history to it, and multiple different generations with different conventions overlaid in top of each other. So sometimes it can get a little wacky. Uh, but in general, that's what they're going for. They're going for origin insertion, right? You can name it after the number of heads, right? For instance, the biceps or the triceps. And of course, by function, which is extensor, abductor, adductor, flexor, things like that. Okay. Or you can have a combination of all of them. So this alone right now, because you have so many different naming conventions, tells you that there was a lot of different people working on nomenclature at the same time with different ways of doing it. And so that's why we get this sort of gamish of all these different ways of looking at it. As if that didn't make your life harder enough already. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the mechanics of the muscles. The first thing to understand is that when you're wiring a muscle to your bone, you're creating a lever system. And so the lever system basically is basic, it's basic physics, right? What you're doing with the lever system. And when you take a look at a lever system, they include a couple of basic standard things. So first of all, they all include a fulcrum, which is kind of the hinge region or the pivot point, if you will. Then there's going to be a weight, W. This is the load that's being moved, right? And then there's the pull or the P. This is the force um, that is being applied in order to move the weight about the pivot point. Okay, that's the fulcrum. So ultimately the idea of a lever, a lever is to essentially apply the force on the fulcrum, which then applies it as a pull to the weight. So you're applying a force, but then is amplified and communicated across the hinge to essentially work on the weight or the load that's being moved. And there's a couple of different classes of levers and we'll take a look at these. So the first class of lever that we see is what's called the class one. This is a situation where the fulcrum is between the force and the weight. So you basically have your fulcrum and you have your force versus your weight. That's a class one, okay? That's kind of like your classic teeter-totter. In this case, if you take a closer look at this, you'll see that your fulcrum is right here in the middle. The weight, which is this kid right here, he's been pushed up, is being moved by the force that you're pushing on the other side. So you basically have your fulcrum in between your load and your force, right? Or your pull. So a good example of this is basically um, flexion of your neck, right? Or hyperextension of your neck is actually what this is. So the fulcrum point is essentially your cervical vertebrae. And then the weight is your head. And then the pull is the back. So you're basically pulling your head back with your neck muscles. They're shortening and it's pulling the weight of your head backwards. So that is a classic teeter-totter move. Now class two, 
is going to be a situation where the weight is between the fulcrum and the pole. So basically now you have your weight, your fulcrum, and your pole. So I'm just going to draw it like that. So this is the classic wheelbarrow uh, situation. So in this case, this would be the handle of the wheelbarrow where you pull it up with your strength and power. The weight or the load is in the bucket and then the fulcrum is the wheel. And so a perfect example um, of this is basically when you are uh, moving the mandible, right? So basically what you have is you have the pull happening at the edge of the mandible, the weight is in the middle and the fulcrum is back here by the um, joint. And so that's kind of the classic wheelbarrow uh, version. So um, class three is when you kind of flip the weight and the pull. So this time, you have your fulcrum and your pole is gonna be in between the weight and the fulcrum or the pivot point. In this particular case, this is essentially your snow shovel. So if you take a look at your snow shovel, typically you grab the shovel up close to the spade. So that is gonna be your pull, right? So you're gonna pull upwards for that load. The weight itself is in the actual shovel, it's in the spade portion. And then the fulcrum or the pivot is going to be where your hand is. So that's basically your snow shovel move. Okay, it depends on where your weight is and where you are applying the force. And so you have three different versions of that. So in this particular case, you have um, an example is like when you're lifting the weight. So for instance, here's a weight in your hand. So you basically, this is like the, the tip of the snow shovel. And then you have the pole piece. And then of course you have the fulcrum, which is your elbow. So when you're shortening your muscle, you're actually exerting the pull force up here on your radius, right? That's basically where your bicep is attached to that radial tuberosity. So basically you're pulling on the upper handle, if you will, of the shovel. Think of your arm as a shovel. So this is your spade, your hand. This is the handle. This is the, the, um, the hand, the tip of the shovel itself. So when your muscle contracts because it's attached to the radius, it's pulling right here, just like you would a snow shovel while hanging onto it at the pivot point, which is the fulcrum. So it's a classic snow shovel move. So those are the three different ways that you can wire things. And of course, then that kind of moves us into our musculature. So this is gonna be our little bit of a tour of our musculature. I don't wanna go deep and heavy into all these muscles because we're gonna sort of go region by region. Um, just, as, just enough to say that this, you know, just take a look at this and use this to study for your muscles because this is a really, really good overlay to little man woman that we have in the lab, right? So this would be a really good use for kind of decoding and getting a good feel for all of the muscles of little man woman. This is the anterior view. This is the posterior view. And so this is a really good place to start. Um, and so I would basically start and really work on a lot of these muscles, start getting some of these locked in and then start working back and forth between muscles and things like this and muscles and keys and muscles and keys, and then get to the point where it's like, okay, I, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable here, right? So that's, that's what um, my goal is for this particular chapter. So let's go ahead and start from the top and just sort of work ourselves down, work our way down. So we're gonna start with the head and neck muscles. So ultimately, when you take a look at your neck region, you've got anterior neck muscles, which are basically in the front. And so those are largely going to be 
for lateral types of head movements, uh, things like that. So basically kind of moving your head from side to side, those are those lateral movements. Um, and so that's what a lot of those are going to be. You'll have a lot of deep muscles. And so one of the things to remember is muscles have lots of layers. We're limited to mostly the superficial, but a lot of the deep ones are the ones um, that gives us problems. For instance, the deeper muscles in the neck will oftentimes um, work on flexion of the neck um, and, and some of those uh, types of movements, so mostly flexion. The posterior ones are going to be looking at extension. It makes a lot of sense, right? Because if you take a look at the anterior deep, you're basically going to be looking at flexion, which is essentially bending your neck forward. And so that's basically your anterior neck muscles contracting. And then your posterior neck muscles, which would be the extensors, would be extending your neck back to the vertical position. Now, your head is one of the places where hyperextension is normal. So if you were to bend your head backwards and look at the ceiling, that's hyperextension, but that's a completely normal movement. You're not injuring yourself. In a lot of other joints, if you do hyperextension, you're damaging the joint, right? Because they're not designed to hyperextend normally. But because we have multiple joints in a row, each of which has a little bit of bend to it, that is that vertebral joint between one vertebra and the next, it gives us the ability to sort of between all of those movements together to be able to move our neck back in a greater degree which gives us a lot more flexibility and visibility. So some of the lateral neck muscles, the ones that are kind of on the side and a little bit of the posterior groups are gonna be involved in things like rotation and abduction. Remember abduction is to move away from the midline, adduction is to move toward the midline. So when you're moving your muscles and you're basically twisting your head and turning, that's basically gonna be a lot of these lateral and posterior neck groups. As a matter of fact, you can feel them as you turn your head. So you can feel some of these muscles contracting on either side as you're moving your head around. Okay. So that's kind of what it looks like. So the sternocleidomastoid is one of the major movers. So this is the one that's basically going to be attached to the manubrium. That's going to be the origin. Its insertion will be the mastoid process. And so, um, that's going to be this big ropey guy. That's one of the major neck muscles um, that basically allows you to be able to move your head around. Uh, the scalene muscles, which are oftentimes, you don't really see them a whole lot, but if you were to kind of cut back and visualize them, you'll see these scalene muscles are kind of like these little sort of vertical muscles that will attach to the clavicle. So their insertion point is the clavicle. And their job is to actually flex your rib cage. They're actually part of your respiratory group muscles. So when you take a deep breath, your scalenes are responsible for pulling your rib cage up by your clavicle so that your lungs can expand inside your rib cage. So you have more than just your diaphragm working in respiratory system. So there's a lot of other little neck muscles. So longissimus um, capitis, basically its origin is um, the thoracic. Uh, vertebra, and it's going to be connected to the mastoid process. So so this is one of those um, deep, um, deep muscles of the neck. Now, a couple of things you'll notice here in these tables. Notice they have origin, insertion, and they have action and innervation. And a lot of AMP sections in a lot of colleges across the country when you go through the section a lot of times especially like if you're in med school you're you're responsible for knowing the muscle its origin its insertion its action and its innervation um, now i kind of back away from the crack pipe a little bit for you guys right because i go with origin insertion that's enough right but not so much innervation and action. And that's mostly because origin and insertion can really help us to understand what the, the nature of the muscle is, is doing. And when we understand what the nature of the muscle is doing, then it allows us to be able to understand oftentimes how to identify it and name it, right? So it all kind of works together to make it a little bit easier. So you also have a couple of others. So you'll notice you have a lot of these guys that are kind of in this sort of rhomboid region. You have splenius capitis basically up here that's connecting those cervical vertebra to the base of the skull. 
uh, the trapezius, which is this large diamond-like structure that covers all of them together. Um, and then uh, your rhomboid groups, which are right here. And so all of those essentially are part of this kind of upper neck region that's kind of connected to the cervical area and then the upper portion of your back in between your scapula. These are the guys, by the way, that you oftentimes tweak. And after a long day of stress, they are hurting a lot, right? We've always probably had uh, muscles that seem like it was underneath our scapula that hurts. And that's a lot of what these little muscles are. So it's usually uh, oftentimes because of poor posture um, and um, overuse, because a lot of times when we get stressed, we're not really thinking about good posture. Oftentimes when we're stressed, long days, hard work, we get tired. Oftentimes we have a natural slouch. We just kind of like start to lose our energy, to hold our body upright. So we kind of have a natural slouch and that starts to build up in those muscles, which oftentimes causes them to um, strain. And then we go home in pain. So, um, those are the muscles of the neck and you have a lot of them, right? I mean, there's more, I mean, obviously there's a, this is just kind of scratching the surface, um, but there's more, but that just gives you a taste for the types of muscles that are there. Notice they're all basically, um, achieve, achieving the same thing. They're trying to specifically, um, pull off some sort of a function, right? So they're all going after a particular movement or something of that nature. Then if you kind of wrap around the front side, you have all the facial expression muscles, for instance, um, a lot of your facial muscles, a lot of these will be good for half head, right? So these are the ones that you want to really get for half head. So for instance, the frontal portion of the occipital frontalis, or sometimes it'll be called just the frontalis, um, or sometimes it'll be called the epicranius, or the frontal body of the epicranius. There's a couple of different ways you can take a look at this. But this is essentially the major muscle that's right up here that raises your eyebrows. And so that's going to be one facial expression. Your levator palpebrae superioris basically raises your eyes up when it contracts. And your zygomaticus major will basically be responsible for raising the corners of your mouth. Now, the levator anguli oris is basically kind of does what it says, the levator of the angle of your mouth. Right, so this is also working with zygomaticus major to basically pull up the corners of your mouth. There's a couple of uh, that are working here. And the rhizorius is kind of a little inward further and it's kind of pulling up um, the interior portion of your lips. You notice you have a lot of different muscles, a lot of very small muscles that are working on various aspects of your facial expression. As far as animals are concerned, our faces are very expressive. We can basically create a lot of different facial expressions because we have a lot of little itty bitty muscles in our face, allowing us to do very fine motion and very fine movements in our face. These are just some of them. So the levator labii superioris is basically gonna allow you to sort of raise your lip like in a snarl. The depressor is going to basically pull your bottom lip down. So you notice these terms, they depress or they levitate, levatus. The nasalis is basically your nose wrinkle. That's what that one's gonna do. The orbicularis oculi kind of says what it says, right? The orbits of the oculum, that is to say your eyes. So this is basically the one that wraps around your eyes. That's your eyelids. Um, and the corrugator supercilii is basically the furrowed eyebrow component. So the procerus, corrugator supercilii, and the nasalis work together to give you the overall furrowed brow with nose wrinkle. By the way, this is basically what dogs are doing when they snarl. They kind of raise their little muzzles and they kind of start wrinkling their little lip. So basically when we're doing that, we're essentially snarling dogs, right? And that's kind of what's happening. Um, then you also have a couple of other uh, muscles, which are kind of crazy. First of all, you have the buccinator, which is kind of like a large muscle um, that kind of sits right about there. Actually, matter of fact, that's actually named after the region, the buccal region, right? Um, which is the mouth. And then the nasalis, part of that, you can pull your nostrils down. So sometimes we do that without even knowing that, right? We kind of like pull it down like that. We kind of pull our nostrils down a little bit. Not a lot, just a little bit. And the orbicular orus will allow us to be able to sort of, sort of pull down the corners of our mouth in a frown-like situation. And your platysma, 
is basically a big sheet of muscle right here in the front of your neck that covers up your sternocleidomastoid. It's like a big web neck. So this is the one that you can see raising up when you kind of flex your neck like that. That's the platysma. Okay. So this is basically what they look like. So here you can see, um, I don't want to go through all of this, but you can see some of those muscles that we're looking at, some of the facial expressions um, that they're responsible for. So the buccinator notice is right here. Notice it's connected to the edges of the mouth. Notice how many muscles are actually around the mouth region. We have a lot of manipulation around the mouth, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because we're able to speak. When we're speaking, we're moving our lips around and we're basically forming very, very specific finite movements to form our words and our speech, right? So we were basically able to do a lot of different types of things with our mouth. And so that's because of all those muscles in there. So work on this. So study some of this and use this to go along with half head, the half head model, because this is basically the key for half head, the lateral view of half head and the frontal view of half head. Okay. So that'd be this guy right here. Okay, so these are your facial expressions. So this is kind of like just the table situation. I don't want to go through all the gory detail because we kind of sketched it out a little bit on the facial slide. But this is for like those of you who are working on uh, studying and you like tables. This is just an indexing way for you to organize the information so that you can sort of have it all in a place that feels good for you. A lot of people like tables because it kind of puts everything in order and kind of puts it in a place where they can find everything. Okay, so that's what this is here for you guys. So mastication, the muscles of mastication, basically that's the fancy word for chewing, right? So there's a couple of muscles associated with this. Number one is you require elevation of the mandible, right? That's moving the mandible upward and depression, which is moving the mandible downward and also excursion, which is side to side grinding. So your uh, muscles will work with a lot of the hyoid muscles. There's a lot of muscles that are attached to the hyoid that will allow you to be able to move the mandible. And so when you take a look then at the chewing piece, you've got a lot of things going on there. It's not just your mandible going up and down. It's also kind of going side to side. You can grind a little bit side to side. That's the excursion piece. But also your tongue is heavily involved, which it is a muscle, right? Your tongue is heavily involved in manipulating the food bowl that's inside your mouth. And not only that, but your cheeks. A lot of people don't realize the necessity of your cheeks in chewing. Your cheeks kind of help also to kind of squeeze and move the food bolus around in your mouth so you can position the food bolus under your teeth so you can get a good chomp on it, right? So you're using your tongue and your cheek to basically manipulate the food bolus under your teeth so that you can get a good grind on it, so you can get a good, good smack on it. And so a lot of people don't realize just how much is going on while they are chewing. So a couple of the major movers of mastication, the biggies are gonna be the masseter, right? So I call the masseter your chewing gum muscle. This is the one when you clench your teeth, this is the one that pops out on the side, this one right here, okay? So that's the major one that drapes over your mandible. And it's directly right over the angle or the ramus of the mandible. So it's literally pulling the mandible up and chomping and creating your bite force. So your bite force is going to be created by the masseter. So you see somebody with a big old masseter popping out because they're gum chewers? Don't get in a fight with them because they bite you. They're going to do some damage, right? Because they got some serious bite force on there. Uh, some dogs with serious bite force, like for instance, uh, big jowl dogs like pit bulls and Rottweilers, right? These are dogs that are notorious for having very strong bite force. That's because those masseters are just massive. They're just really huge. And so when they hit you, there's like, there's like a vice clamping down on you. And so that's a major mover 
of your masseter, but you also have your temporalis, which is basically the muscle right over your ear. It's covering your temporal bone. And so whenever you're chewing, if you notice, it's kind of hard. If you got gum, chew it. But you can feel your masseter chewing. Some of you, you can see your masseter kind of flexing out when you take a bite on the gum. But you also feel your temple flexing as well as you chew. That's your temporalis. That's part of your chewing mechanism. A couple of the other things that are basically attached to um, this, uh, this piece, some of them are attached to the hyoid, are the pterygoids. So basically the pterygoids are muscles that are kind of underneath. So you have to kind of peel away and kind of remove some skull bones. Notice here we've removed the zygomatic bone. These are underneath. Um, these are basically all muscles that are underneath in this area, the soft area, just below your mandible. So your, your tongue is under there and you have all these other little muscles under there. So your pterygoids, your lateral pterygoids are also part of that chewing mechanism. And so you have both lateral and you have medial pterygoids. So the pterygoids, when they flex, are basically going to be able to sort of, you notice their angle, they're gonna be able to sort of give you a little bit of side to side grind when they, when they flex. Okay. So here they are, right? The pterygoids basically um, are going to um, the, give you the side to side grinding. You don't have a lot of it, right? So you're not a big side to side grinder. You're more of a direct grind, you're a chomper. You're, you're, you're basically, crack, you're a nutcracker is what you are. There's basically you put stuff in between your teeth and you crack it, you break it. That's what you do. So that's more of the masseter. If you're more like a cow, right? If you've ever seen a cow chew, it's kind of, it's kind of sliding its jaw kind of side to side, back and forth as it chews its cud. So it has a much stronger lateral pterygoid and medial pterygoid muscle. So if you were to dissect a cow, you'd expect to see a much more well-developed pterygoid group. Okay, so the hyoid muscles, these are also um, involved in various stages of chewing as well. So for instance, you'll see these different muscles that are attached to the hyoid. The hyoid bone is the only one that's not attached to another bone. It's basically strung up by a bunch of muscles. So it's literally like a tug of war flag. It's not connected to anything. It's just, it's just, it's just suspended in space by two muscle groups tugging on it in different directions. And so on the inferior side, you're going to have a couple of muscles. For instance, you'll have the omohyoid, which is the outer, omo for outer. And then you'll have the sterno hyoid, which is the, um, the inner portion. And so those two will be basically flanking your trachea and connecting to the bottom portion of the hyoid bone. And then on the top, you're going to have a series, right? You have the digastric. And some of you guys were looking for the digastric in the cat. And I think we kind of saw it a little bit in one of the cats. I don't remember which cat that was, but I think we saw it a little bit. This kind of have these two bellies, basically the digastric here. And then underneath that is going to be what's called your mylohyoid. Um, that's just above your stylohyoid. Now, all of these are attached to the hyoid bone. So these muscles up here are pulling in this direction. And these muscles down here are pulling in that direction. That keeps your hyoid bone right there in the middle. So those are all part of your chewing mechanism. And they're very important. Notice you got a lot of muscles in your neck. Right. Some are for moving your head. A lot of them are for chewing. A lot of those smaller ones are for chewing. So chewing actually has a lot of musculature associated with it, which is kind of amazing. Most people think of their masseter, maybe. They don't realize just how many muscles are involved in chewing. Okay. So these are your hyoid muscles, the ones that are essentially bound to the hyoid. And again, I leave the table for you guys as a study tool, as a study aid, to go over these muscles. Um, so notice we can break these into superhyoid, the ones that are above the hyoid pulling upward and the infrahyoid, the ones that are below the hyoid pulling downward. Okay. So in between is the hyoid basically stuck in the middle of the tug of war between these two muscle groups. So you'll see that many of them, their insertion is the hyoid which is the reason why they're part of the hyoid group. So even though your hyoid doesn't seem like it's a significant little bone, it actually has a rather significant number of muscles. For such a small bone, 
it's got a ton of muscles attached to it. Probably more so if you take a look at it uh, on a, on a per size basis than most other bones. Okay. okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at your tongue movement. So basically your tongue, which is another important muscle in um, mastication and speech, of course, um, has multiple different movements that you can do with it. Obviously, the, the job of the tongue, for the most part, is to move food around the mouth. Um, you can also hold it in place while the teeth grind it. So on the interior side of the teeth, you can kind of push the food underneath the teeth and then hold it and keep the food from squishing out like a grape, for instance, while you sort of bite on the grape. And on the other side, your cheek is keeping it from popping out from between your teeth. Um, the other thing is also you're going to push food to the back of your throat when you're ready to swallow. So this is an important contraction of your tongue. It's that when you're ready to swallow it, your tongue moves that food bowl to the back of your throat where the swallowing kicks in and becomes involuntary. And of course, we also use this for speech, right? Much of our tongue and much of our um, words, our sounds are actually produced by our tongue combination of tongue and teeth, right? So the tongue is an important component of speech as well. So inside the tongue, you're gonna have a couple of different muscles. You'll have intrinsic muscles, which are basically only the tongue proper. And then extrinsic muscles, which are typically kind of, uh, uh, they're, how should we say, accessory to the tongue, right? So you have the tongue proper, which are the intrinsics what we think of as a tongue. And then you have the sort of associated muscles that aid the tongue in what it does, but they're not actually part of the tongue. So they're separated from the tongue. Those are the extrinsic muscles. They're kind of outside the tongue, aiding in the tongue's movements. So this is, uh, this is basically what your tongue looks like. So your tongue muscles, if you take a look at it, the intrinsic ones pretty much are all part of the tongue proper. So that's where the intrinsics are. And so ultimately it's all inside the tongue itself. Now the extrinsic are typically associated with that. For instance, you have, um, these will usually carry the term glossus on it for gloss, glossary. Basically that's referring to the tongue itself. And so for instance, palatoglossus is basically a, no, a name, nomenclature that is associated with it's a connection, right? So in this case, you have the origin, palate, and its insertion, tongue, palatoglossus. In addition to that, you also have styloglossus, again, an origin insertion name, where your origin is the styloid process of the temporal bone, and of course, your insertion is the tongue. And then hyoglossus is the hyoid, and of course, the insertion is the tongue. And then of course the genioglossus. So the genio, um, you may have run into that in the mandible, in the mandible studies, is basically the mental or the genial protuberance or the mental tuber protuberance of the um, mandible. And of course the insertion is the tongue. So notice they're all basically similar. Now the innervation sometimes, which is helpful for the nervous system is all the hypoglossal nerve. A Lot of cranial nerves in charge of these muscles. Okay, and some of you may refer may remember that hypoglossal term from the hypoglossal canal that you guys remember as one of the holes in the skull. That's where the hypoglossal nerve passes through on its way from the brain to the tongue. Okay, so when you're swallowing, basically what's going to happen is you um, move the food bolus to the back of the throat. Uh, beyond the soft palate, when the, where you hit the pharynx. And so that's basically where you're going to see a lot of musculature back in those areas. Um, and so when you're swallowing, you have a group of muscles that will actually move the pharynx upward. It basically elevates the pharynx. Um, and then um, in addition to that, as it moves that pharynx upwards, you also have another, uh, the salingopharyngeus, pharyngeus, pharyngeus, I can never say that out the first time or the second time, apparently. <laughs> right, the first time. This is a constrictor of the pharynx, right? And so what this does is what happens is as you're moving food to the back of the pharynx, 
the first thing you do is you elevate the pharynx to kind of open up the passageways as the food moves to the back of your pharynx. And then when you swallow, what happens is you constrict the pharynx. You basically tighten it around the food bolus, and that basically gets the food bolus moving downward in the esophagus. So what happens is it kind of, you move it back, it lifts up so you can move it to the back. And then the constrictors will constrict on it, and that starts to squeeze it down the esophagus and, and heading for the stomach. That's what these two are doing. And so these are basically the muscles of your larynx. I don't want to go through all of these because there's a lot of them. Again, just like with your mouth, you have a lot of little muscles associated with your larynx. And a lot of these are associated with your vocal control. So if you notice something, our mouth and upper, um, upper respiratory tract is highly like um, adapted for speech, right? I mean, we have a lot of areas where we create the capacity to manipulate speech. I mean, we see it in our tongue, right? In the ability to manipulate our tongue allows us to form words. We see it in the muscles in our face and allows us to be able to round out the sound with our lips, as well as communicate with facial expressions while we're communicating verbally, right? And then in addition to that, it keeps going because now in our larynx, we have all these different muscles, all of which are basically designed to essentially manipulate and narrow our voice box, which allows us to control the tenor, the quality, and the vibrancy, and the, the, the just the tonal capacity of our voice. So all of these are necessary, if you think about it, are adaptations multiple rounds of adaptation. We have three major areas of adaptation, all of which gives us the capacity to communicate, which is really unusual because most mammals don't have that level of intricacy in their communication, right? We have three levels that really torques us out. We, among all species on the planet, we are master communicators. And we don't see anything like us on the planet because nothing comes even close to those types of adaptations that we have to be able to manipulate that. Um, if you just think about, just, just think about what it takes. Like you go to a vocal coach or you read up on vocal coaching and training and just look at all the different nuances that people are trained to use uh, in order to change the delivery of their voice, right? Or Oftentimes in public speaking, they will teach you and train you how to use your face to communicate with others, right? For instance, a lot of times politicians, at least the smart ones, will oftentimes take a little bit. Of, I know Bill Clinton did this. That's why Bill Clinton was like a master communicator, right? Even though he screwed up, a lot of times people just still loved him because he was just a really good communicator. He had a way, he knew how to manipulate his face, his voice and his body to communicate to the public. And that's what got through to voters. That's the reason why voters were like, okay, whatever. You know, um, you made mistakes, that's okay, we all do. Let's go do it again, right? Um, so that he was a really, really, Obama, another really good master communicator. His, um, he wasn't quite as expressive as Clinton or quite as, um, how do you say, folksy or personable as Clinton. But you could hear the way he had trained his voice to basically manipulate these larynx muscles to create a very unique and effective quality to his communication. So all of these are basically designed to give us a lot of masterful communication capacity. And so these are basically your soft palate muscles, which are essentially the ones we saw before, like the palatoglossus and things like that, that are essentially designed for moving that food bolus into the back of the throat and then manipulating that food bolus so that it can go down your esophagus. Okay. And so a lot of these guys are going to be way back here in the back of your throat. Typically, it's covered with that thin membrane of uh, epithelium and mucus. Because kind of brains right in the back of your throat. There's a lot going on there. Okay, that's great. If you guys are singers, 
because now all of a sudden you have something to train for, right? So you know how to manipulate your vocal cords. You know how to communicate with people with facial expressions. You know how to communicate with your words, right? Um, now let's go ahead and take a look at, again, your senses. In this case, your eyeball. So your eyeball basically has a couple of good ones. Now, this is going to be one of those that we want to really kind of spend some time on. The, the others, I mean, if you don't know all of the larynx muscles, I mean, don't don't drive yourself crazy here, right? Um, that's that's cool. Um, the facial muscles are probably the most important because those are the easiest ones for us to see, and it also overlaps with what we're doing in lab. So those are the primary ones. Um, some of the basics of the tongue is good. Uh, maybe some of the major muscles that are just right around the vocal cords that helps you to kind of like shut down. Those two are good. Uh, but all of them, there's a ton of them. I mean, let's face it, you're not going to know all the muscles, right? That's just the way it is. But I'm going to try to star the ones that are really, really biggies, the ones that we really understand, because especially for the eyeballs, it's going to be setting up our senses chapter as we start to move forward when we get to the nervous system. But also, this is our dominant sense. So a couple of things. First of all, obviously, you perceive the world through your eyes. What you see is what you understand as reality, right? So you're, it's, a, it's a major sense. But in addition to this, you also are able to communicate with your eyes. It's kind of weird to think of, but you do. Your eyes are very expressive. Here, here you may say, your eyes are really expressive or something like that. Maybe not to you, but you've heard it said to other people. Nobody's ever said that to me. They just to let you know that's <laughs> right. But you hear that from time to time, right? So what they're saying is that you're not just, it's not your eyeball itself. It's the facial muscles around your eye. So when you are feeling an emotion, you know how to sort of make your facial muscles express what you're feeling, right? So those are oftentimes what we're talking about. When you take a look at your eye, you have a couple of different types of muscles and it's mostly designed for eyes movement. So the movement of your eyes. So for instance, you'll have what's called the oblique muscles. Your oblique muscles are typically either diagonal um, or they're kind of, they cut across the normal plane. So the oblique muscles, if you take a look at the eyeball, are gonna be these muscles that begin kind of a, a right around the optic nerve. And so then basically what they do is they kind of wrap around this kind of what's called a trochlea. It's kind of like a little connective tissue cuff. Um, and then what it does, it basically threads through the connective tissue cuff and then wraps and attaches to the sclera or the white of the eye. And so what, and you have an inferior one and you have a superior one. And so you can see here, you have um, the superior, which is at the top of the eye. So this is actually a better view of the eye. So the superior one, which is at the top of the eye and the inferior one, which is at the bottom of the eye. Now, what these guys basically do is they essentially elevate or depress the eye. Elevate, remember, means you move it up. So you look upwards. Depress means you move downward. That's basically your obliques that are doing that. Now, the other one is what's called the rectus muscles. And you have several of them. So you have inferior, lateral, medial, superior. Now, notice something. Your rectus muscles, which are named after a shape, rectangular, right, are basically positioned and they're attached in all four points of the compass of your eye. Superior on the top of your eye, inferior on the bottom of your eye, medial on the inside of your eye, lateral on the outside of your eye. So that basically gives you connection so that you can either move your eye from the inferior side, you can depress it, and you can move it medially. So lateral depression is your oblique. Medial depression is going to be your rectus. The lateral one gives you lateral eye movement. So when you move your eye to the side, one eye is pointing lateral. That's your lateral doing that. The other one is medial. The medial one is doing that. And then the, um, the superior one is going to be elevating your eye medially. So notice you've got lateral elevators and depressors and medial elevators and depressors. When you coordinate all these guys together, then what you get is the ability to sort of 360 degree rotate, well, not, well almost like you know, rotational motion, 
So these are the rectus. So here you can see this is your lateral rectus here. And then your um, medial, your inferior rectus is down here underneath. Your medial rectus is on the other side. And then your superior rectus is going to be this guy right here. So that allows you to be able to move your eyes up, down, side to side. And then with the obliques, you can basically roll them. So those are your rollers. So let's go ahead and take a look then at the trunk muscles. Now, a couple of things, first of all, you'll notice the nerves in particular. All of these nerves right here, oculomotor, trochlear, abducens, these are all cranial nerves. We're gonna learn about those in the next couple of chapters in the nervous system. You have 12 cranial nerves. A lot of those cranial nerves are basically innervating your senses, okay? So when we get to the cranial nerve section, you might behoove you to go back to this chapter and then retake a look at these um, eye muscles and take a look at them with respect to the cranial nerves. By the way, the hypoglossal is also a cranial nerve, okay? So, so far we've been really looking at what the cranial nerves have been doing. Now it's gonna start moving down and get into the trunks, right? So basically the trunk muscles are essentially going to be um, those that are wired to and responsible for moving the vertebral column. So ultimately they will give you some lateral flex. They'll be able to rotate the vertebral column and essentially they'll be able to produce erect posture, which I do not have right now. So now I do, go ahead. It's not going to be on the lab exam. Um, uh, pieces of chapter 10 will be on the lecture exam, but I will. Um, so one of the things I want to do on um, Thursday is kind of highlight the pieces that we want to focus on for the lecture exam. The lab exam we're going to take care of. That's our list. This for this one, because it's lecture, some like more of the mechanic stuff, that's going to be lecture stuff. I'm not going to talk about that on the lab exam. So all that fulcrum stuff, uh, nomenclature strategies, things like that, that would all be lecture exam material. Okay. Um, so, and that's just to kind of help you to kind of round that stuff out. That way we can uh, talk about this chapter on Thursday and on Tuesday. Um, well, no, not Tuesday because that's exam day but on Thursday and kind of preparation for um, that exam. So you'll be able to kind of get touch on a lot of these muscles. Make sense? Okay, so ultimately when you're taking a look at the muscles that um, string up the vertebra, um, these are gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of deep ones, right? So these deep, deep ones basically will um, connect one vertebra to another. These are very postural in nature. There's also very superficial ones. Um, these typically will oftentimes connect the vertebrae to the ribs. And so these are your postural muscles. Oftentimes when you take a look at these guys, um, the superficial ones are kind of some of the ones that we talked about in the upper region of the neck. So it kind of starts in the neck and starts to move down the back, for instance. Um, you have them kind of grouped into uh, pieces. Uh, for instance, your longissimus group is going to be, you're going to have what well, we already took, talked about capitis, right? That's going to be one of those neck muscles. Um, the cervicus piece is going to be part of your neck, upper neck muscles in the cervical um, area. The thoracis is going to be associated with connecting um, your thoracic vertebra to your lumbar vertebra. Notice they're named after who they're connecting to, the thoracis. And the spinalis basically is going to be um, associated with those muscles that are connected, interconnected by the spinous process. So let's take a look at these guys. So this is kind of what it looks like. These are your neck muscles. This is kind of what it looks like. There's a lot going on there, right? This is one of the reasons why I don't want you to necessarily die on this hill, right? There's a couple of ones that we tend to run into, like levator scapula, for instance, right? So that's going to be this big one that's basically moves from the 
edge of the superior angle of the, of the um, scapula and connects to the uh, cervical vertebrae. Um, and you can see a couple of them, splenius capitis, for instance, is cut, but it basically goes down. Longissimus uh, capitis, which is another one that basically connects to the vertebra up to the mastoid process. So you can see how a lot of these are interconnected to those upper regions of your spine and your scapula. This is one of the reasons why when you have a lot of stress, you carry it right there in those little neck muscles. And so those are the ones oftentimes that hurt and you gotta get them massaged out and beaten into mush, right? So when you take a look at your back then from the um, deeper muscles, when you kind of peel off those layers, you can see you have a lot of long muscles that basically kind of run right along the edge of your spinal column. And so there's a lot of them, too many of us, too many for us to, um, um, to memorize. But these are a lot of the muscles oftentimes that could give us back problems if the muscles are kind of out of whack. And these are actually more important because you can see how each of the vertebrae are tied together. So you can see these, these inter transversarii basically connecting your transverse processes together uh, with some musculature. You can also see the same thing, some musculature. These are the interspinalis connecting your spinous processes together. Your rotatories, which are basically connecting uh, portions of the body to the spinous process. And then more of an angular type of a muscle the multifidus, uh, which is basically connecting like one vertebra to the next or connecting across vertebra. This is keeping your entire vertebral column like wired together. So you don't just have the joints, you have muscles also, muscles. You have muscles also pulling them all together and holding all of your vertebrae together. This is another area where there's a lot going on here. Like if you're into chiropractic, you spend a lot of time on these muscles, on the muscles of the upper back and all those deep and superficial muscles that are going from the neck all the way down to the back, because that's the majority of what you're working on when you're talking about chiropractic. And I know Trey is rolling his eyes because I know how he feels about chiropractors. But anyway, um, so what we'll do is we will continue on with our thoracic muscles because we already are at a witching hour. And we will start with the thoracic muscle mu muscles muscles and we'll just basically keep on rolling we'll do our best on thursday to kind of finish up uh, the chapter so there's some sections i want to go a little quicker on and others that i want to kind of hang on a little bit um but that's that's where we will pick up